So in this video, let's talk about the pressure volume loop. So whenever we're talking about the pressure volume loop, on the x-axis we have volume, and on the y-axis we have pressure. Okay, so let's first talk about how the pressure volume loop is going to look like when we are talking about a normal graph or normal loop. So what happens after the mitral close? After the mitral close, the pressure in the ventricle starts increasing, it starts rising, and, um, and the pressure keeps rising until that pressure is more than the pressure of the aortic valves and the valves open and we have the ejection fraction but the pressure keeps on rising a little bit even though blood is pushed out of the ventricles onto the aorta and a point comes when the systole ends and the pressure doesn't rise anymore that's when uh, the pressure in the in the ventricles drop that's when the aorta close and we start to have isovolumetric relaxation and the heart starts filling again. So this would be a normal cardiac cycle. But what's going to happen when we have increased preload? So before we go there, I first want to talk about some other things. And that is, so this is where the mitral close, this is where the aorta opens, this is where the aorta close, and this is where the um, mitral open and this is also the point what we call is the end systolic volume or afterload and this point here is the end diastolic volume or preload okay continuing on so if we have increased preload that's our situation one when do we have increased preload by the way let's say we are giving someone saline significant amount of saline that's when we have increased preload did you think this volume is going to increase it's going to move in this direction obviously because we're increasing preload so the mitral opens our heart starts filling in 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 and the preload really increases it goes through isovolumetric contraction but this is going to reach because there is more volume, this is going to reach um, the, the aorta, aortic pressure much faster and we're going to have a shorter uh, isovolumetric contraction. So the aorta is going to open much faster. Okay? And the pressure also increases uh, after the aortic valve opens and then aorta close, pressure drops and we have isovolumetric relaxation and the, and the cycle continues. So this is what happens when we have increased preload. By the way, end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume is our stroke volume. So this would be our stroke volume from here to here. Okay, so let's now change the scenario. What if we say now that we are increasing the afterload instead of the preload we're increasing the afterload where is afterload afterload is right here this volume is going to now increase because we're increasing the afterload okay so, so let's start from here so so our preload doesn't change it's only our afterload that changes right it's, it gets higher so after the mitral close we have isovolumetric contraction okay and so there is greater pressure in the aorta so the, so the pressure the you need to overcome that greater pressure because of that greater afterload in the aorta is much 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 higher than the normal curve okay so a lot of the time is spent in overcoming that pressure in the aorta the pressure drops and aorta close really really quickly because systole is much shorter now okay aorta opens aorta close we have isovolumetric relaxation and the cycle cycle continues so this would what we this is what we're going to have if our graph looks like it has increased afterload okay so the last scenario is increased contractility if you have increased contractility your mitral will uh, close and your heart is going to work much harder than the normal cardiac cycle okay and then it will equalize with the aortic pressure the aorta will open aorta 
will open and you are going to keep on pushing and pushing and pushing you have more contractility you're, you're going to keep on pushing because you have more contractility past the normal cardiac cycle because your cardiac contractility is higher so you're going to have a lower um, a after load okay so you're going to have a lower after load before the aorta close and you have the normal cardiac cycle so see this is our end systolic volume before and this is our end systolic volume now and we have a greater stroke volume because there is less blood or less afterload volume in the ventricle after, after the aorta closed um, so this would be our end systolic volume here this would be our preload we're just going to have more more volume as stroke volume when, when you have greater contractility of the heart so now that we understand the concept, let's do some examples. So in this question, it says that a 45-year-old male presents to the emergency room with two-day history of dyspnea, orthopnea, and ankle swelling. A nitroprusside infusion is promptly initiated. How will the pressure volume loop look like? Okay. So we know that this patient had some CHF problem. Okay, history of dyspnea, orthopnea, and ankle swelling, and we use nitroprusside. So, what does nitroprusside really do? Nitroprusside is going to vasodilate and venodilate. Okay, so there is going to be less pressure in the in the veins and in the aorta. The result: How will our curve look? Let's say this is our normal. I'm going to quickly draw the normal. Our curve is going to look like it's going to have a lower preload and a lower afterload. Okay, and so the graph is going to kind of shift to the right. Sorry, to the to the left. Um, so our graph is kind of going to shift to the left because we're going to need lower preload and lower afterload. Lower preload because of uh, venodilation, lower afterload because of vasodilation. And the stroke volume will remain the same. The reason the stroke volume is going to remain the same is because the afterload is also decreased, right? So the volume being pushed out is going to be the same, it's just that we are dealing with lesser volume because of uh, the dilation. So that's how it's going to look if we have nitroprusside infusion in a patient with CHF. So the next question deals with a 44-year-old male is hospitalized with multiple injuries. An AV shunt is created by the injury. Now how will the pressure volume curve look like? Okay. Again, we're going to draw a normal one like so. And now we are going to think about what is happening. There is an atrovenous shunt. What happens when there is atrovenous shunt? More and more blood get, gets bypassed, gets bypassed um, and it doesn't have to go through the capillaries, which is going to slow it down, which is going to make the process much, much slower, and there is more return of the blood through the shunt onto the veins, right? As a result, we're going to have increased preload right we're gonna have increased preload so this is a straightforward question we just have to know what our pressure volume curve loop look like if there is increased preload and we already talked about it this is our preload this is going to be increased right but the pressure it's going to reach the pressure much quickly uh, because of more volume and aorta is going to open much faster and we're going to have isomal isovolumetric relaxation and the cardiac loop is going to kind of look like that. So let's do another question here. In this question it says a 35 year old female who recently immigrated from Russia complains of weakness, exertional dyspnea and orthopnea. On cardiac auscultation a snap followed by a rumbling diastolic murmur is heard over the cardiac apex. At which point it best corresponds to the snap of a cardiac cycle loop. So let's draw it really quickly. Let's draw our 
uh, our loop, our normal loop. Let's say this is our normal loop. And we want to find out where we're going to hear the snap. Okay? And we know that the person is going through a rumbling diastolic murmur. When the ventricle is at diastole, that means the ventricles are filling, okay? Atria is contracting, right? Because atria contracts, fills the ventricles. And before atria can contract, before uh, the blood can rush from the atria to the ventricles, the mitral has to open, and the mitral opens here, okay? So a diastolic murmur is heard. It's hard when the atria is contracting and the ventricle is relaxing, okay? And blood is rushing from the atria to the ventricle. So a murmur is heard when there is mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis because it has to follow from the atria to the ventricle to a very stenotic valve, and that's why we hear diastolic murmur. We also hear diastolic murmur um, in, in, in diastole when there is aortic regurgitation or pulmonic regurgitation, right? Because systole already happened and the blood flows back onto the heart through the regurgitant valves. These are diastolic murmurs. What about systolic murmurs? They are going to be mitral regurg or tricuspid regurg or aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis, just the opposite. So, in this case, we have a diastolic murmur is heard at the cardiac apex. Um, so it's one of these. At which point best corresponds a snap? So we know that opening snap refers to uh, the mit mitral stenosis or tricuspid stenosis, right? So in this pressure volume loop, we know that we're talking about mitral because we're talking about the left ventricle uh, mainly. So we're going to hear the snap, opening snap right at this particular point.